children four years of age up through third grade can be dismissed. Jonah is where your Bibles are open. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Jonah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm so glad you came tonight. Thank God for America. Isn't it a blessing just to be a part of this great land? And anybody that's traveled abroad has a greater and a deeper appreciation for America. But you don't have to travel abroad to appreciate it. Yeah. You know, I have a, a friend of mine. He's 80-some years of age, lives up in Minnesota. He was my grandpa's neighbor. His name is Mr. Abramson, a big, tall, red-haired Swede. And uh, he, he loves Minnesota, loves it. He's never been really anywhere but Minnesota. But he loves Minnesota. And uh, he loves his lake. He loves the seasons. He loves the snow. He loves the winter. We're out on the lake, and he's just t telling how great it is to be a part of this part of the country in Minnesota and right there on Swan Lake. And look at this. It's just Who would want to leave a place like this? I said, have you ever been to the Gulf of Mexico? He said, nope, don't want to. <laughs> you know, I appreciate somebody that appreciates where they're at, don't yeah, you? Amen. You know, just loves where they're at. And it's all about where they're at. You know, I love that. So you don't have to be, you don't have to have left America to appreciate this great land. But any student of history would appreciate what God has given us in this country. Amen. Any student of, of the different ideologies would appreciate what God has given us in this grand thing called freedom. Amen. Thank God for America. Amen. And may she thrive. And may she thrive until Jesus comes. Amen. And may God make her, her shores filled with, uh, filled with many, many people who have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Thank God. Amen for America. Let's bow in prayer and ask him once again to bless our time. Father, thank you so much for this country that you've given to us. Thank you for the privilege that you've granted us tonight to hear the word of God as it's preached. Thank you for each one that's gathered in this place. And Lord, for those that have served our country and are currently serving our country, we're grateful. Lord, so grateful for those who keep our freedoms just that free. Lord, I pray that we as Americans would examine our own hearts tonight. And may we not do anything at all that would inhibit the greatness of America. But Lord, may we add to the future greatness of America. Lord, may we seek you on our face and seek you for real revival. Oh, how we need it. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that tonight, once again, the power of God would be so evident and so real that it would be something undeniable. Help me as I preach to preach boldly and clearly. May no one leave, not, no one, may no one leave wondering what was said and what you were trying to get across. And Lord, for anyone here that may be lost and without Christ, we pray that you'd save them in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. It was 1973, and a lady who was expecting a baby, her fifth child, was talking to her doctor. That year, earlier in the year, about 11 months earlier, Roe v. Wade had passed, and the doctor said to this lady who was 40, are you considering having, a, having an abortion? They're legal now. And she said, I am absolutely not considering it. And I'm glad she chose that path. Amen. The doctor... <clears throat> The doctor warned her that at her age, there may be some health complications. And at that time, of course, they were far less able and capable to prevent some of those things that may complicate the pregnancy. She said, I'm absolutely not considering it. She went on to have that baby, and that baby was me. I'm so thankful for my mom choosing against a cultural revolution that began to sweep in 1973. Sometimes when I look at America and see how far she's drifted from her moorings and from the Bible principles upon which she was founded, and don't let anybody tell you that she was not founded upon Bible principles, Amen. and don't let any crazed Christian tell you that it's wrong to love your country. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why is it wrong to love your country? Right. Especially a country that's built upon the ideal of freedom. Yes. Uh, it's absolutely not wrong to love your country. Don't let anybody guilt you into thinking that it is. Or that somehow loving your country and what God has done here in America is the antithesis of the Bible. Thank God for every Christian that stands for Christ in a nation that is filled with communist or socialist or wicked ideologies. 
<clears throat> but thank God for an ideology called freedom that's rooted in the Bible. Amen. And so I often look at the drift in our nation and our land and wonder, is, it any, is there any way to arrest this drift? Is there any way to impede it? Is there any way to, to prevent the, the dam from bursting? Is there any way to keep the tide of wickedness from continuing? Uh, I was talking to a preacher friend of mine just a couple weeks ago, and he was down in a ministry in Florida. And while he was down in that ministry in Florida, he, he was out golfing with some of his preacher friends and some older evangelists that he had just met. And uh, he was telling them that his burden, his, his burden for revival and his burden to see the hand of God come upon the nation once again. And he said, these two evangelists, one of them was really trying to get a meeting in his church. But as he brought up the idea of revival, this older evangelist said, oh, no, 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 not in America. She's done. Put a fork in it. And he said he still wanted to have a meeting in my church. And I said, I wouldn't have you if my life depended on it. He said, why wouldn't you have me? He says, because here you're going all over the country telling us to believe God for great things. And yet you don't even believe that there's any hope for their, your country. Right. He said, I wouldn't have you. Yeah. Now hear me. The day may be dark. Yeah. And the hour may be late. And sin may seem to be a raving and a roaming giant like Goliath. But as long as God is on the throne, and long as breath flows through your body, yeah. there is hope for any nation, any country, anywhere that will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to say about those preachers that seem to somehow think there's no hope for America. They ought to do one of two things. Either they ought to get right with God or get out of the ministry. Right. I want to show you from the book of Jonah, a book that doesn't necessarily seem to say anything about America, but gives us very vital principles on the subject of revival, that there is hope for revival. I want to ask the question tonight, what can save America? What can save America when alcohol and beer flow freely in her streets? What can save America when drugs seem to be in an epidemic proportion? What can save America when abortion is allowed and tolerated and encouraged and defended and fought for at the highest levels of our land and in other instances just overlooked? What can save America when it seems like our educational system is filled with humanism and godlessness? Is there any hope? What can save America when our churches have become so worldly there's little difference between them and the world they seek to save? What can save America? What can save America when preachers lack courage and lack backbone and can't even stand up and throw themselves down in courage in a fight against what is evil and what is unrighteous? What can save America? Well, I want to show you three things that are borne out and emphasized in the book of Jonah. Now, he had been called by God and told by God very plainly he was to go to Nineveh. He was to preach judgment to a nation that had thumbed its nose in the face of their creator long enough. And Jonah's answer to God's go was a simple no. He turned his back and went the other way. He went down to Tarshish. He went down into the ship. He went down into the bottom of the boat. And I'll tell you, whenever you go away from God, and when God says go, you say no, the only direction is down. That's exactly what happened with Jonah. While he was in the bottom of the boat, while his head was put on a pillow or up on his Samsonite, it, the boat launched away from its moorings and got out into the sea, and God had prepared a storm just for that ship, just for that backsliding preacher, just for that vessel, just for that crew. And that storm was unlike anything that they'd ever seen before. They were, they were afraid for their lives. They were calling out to their own gods. Jonah uh, was fast asleep like every other carnal Christian is while a great alarm and great trouble was on deck. Yeah. Finally, the shipmaster came down and said, Hey, wake up. We've got a trouble up on deck. So they got up there and they're throwing, bailing, uh, throwing out their goods and services. And all of a sudden, uh, they realized this is way bigger than them. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And the shipmaster said, what is your name and what is your occupation? He said, I'm Jonah. Whenever I read that phrase, what is your occupation? I think about filling out a customs declaration when I go overseas. What is your occupation? Evangelist. And now Jonah has to fill out his occupation, prophet, and admit that he's a backslidden prophet. Not right with God. And he's rebuked 
by the shipmaster. So he tells him that he fears God, he's a Hebrew, and that the reason this storm is here is because he's backsliding on God. You'd think that'd be a good time for Jonah to get right. But Jonah didn't get right. He knew that there was only one thing that they could do. They threw him overboard. They didn't want to do it. But he said, if you don't do it, that's going to be the end of your life and the end of this ship. So they took him in one fell swoop, threw him overboard. And when they did, God had prepared a three-day, three-night timeshare in the belly of a great fish. <laughs> you talk about a miserable timeshare. That was one right there. And so here he is now. We don't know exactly how long it was from the time Jonah hit the water to the time that fish bit on this bait. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know if Jonah was a good swimmer or a bad swimmer. I don't suppose that any kind of swimmer would do fair or fare very well in these kind of conditions. But here Jonah was. And now he was in the brink. And now he was swimming. Or maybe he was a bad swimmer and he was sinking. And while he was there, all of a sudden comes this great fish and swallows him whole. Do you know, someone needs to preach a message sometime on the subject, there are some things worse than dying. <laughs> I'd say that right there would be right up there, ranked in the top three, wouldn't you? There are some things worse than dying. Jonah doesn't have a cell phone he can whip out and turn on the light. He doesn't have a match, and if he did, it probably wouldn't do him any good anyway. But Jonah's right here in the bottom of the belly of this fish, down, down into the depths of the sea. What are you going to do now? Die a slow, miserable, painful death? All the while thinking about your disobedience? What are you going to do now, Jonah? Well, Jonah was there in the belly of the whale, and that's where our story begins. The Scripture tells us in Jonah chapter 1 and verse number 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and, all, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Watch verse number four. It says, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Uh, wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Uh, uh, he says in verse number six, uh, thou ha yet thou hast brought, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. Wow. Let's just pause for a moment and consider what the Bible says concerning Jonah's prayer. Number one, what can save America? Are you ready? Number one is a return to Bible precept. Amen. What can save America? What can save her from the slippage, from the brink? What can save her from going over the edge? A return to Bible precept. Precept. Now, folks, it won't help you tonight. It won't help me tonight as the message is preached if we're thinking about everybody else in our community and in our nation that needs to return to Bible precept. If judgment must begin, it must begin in the house of God. We need to return to Bible precept in our marriages, in our parenting, and in our homes, and in our church life, and in our witness, and in our prayer. We must return to Bible precept. Amen. And so I want us to think in those lights. I want you to understand that there was a return to Bible precept. Where did this return to Bible precept take place? In the belly of a whale. So now, since we're in a church auditorium with padded pews and nice piano music in the background, when the invitation time comes, or you don't even have to wait till then, you can get right with God before the invitation time comes. Yeah. Uh, but since we're in church, this is a good place to return to Bible precept. Yeah. But folks, you don't have to be in church to return to Bible precept. Yeah. You can be in the belly of a whale to return to Bible precept. You can be in a jail like Manasseh to return to Bible precept. Yeah. 
You can be, you can be like Jacob uh, away from God to return to Bible precept in a foreign land. You can be like a prodigal son in the far country and return to Bible precept. You can be in a hog pen and return to Bible precept. Wherever you're at, you need to start by returning right there and seeking God, crying out to Him and saying, God, I've messed up my life. I've had the opportunity to ruin it, and that's exactly what I've done. But Lord, right now, I'm returning to Bible precept. Now, the Holy Spirit of God transcends any preacher's ability to preach, transcends any sermon notes, transcends any time limits. And long before I started preaching tonight, the Holy Spirit was already dealing with you about specific ways that He wants you to return to Bible precept. So start there. Start there. When Elisha the prophet was, was called upon by those that were expanding the dormitory in the Bible college there, in the book of 2 Kings, uh, it, the Scripture tells us that, that he, he, they, he said, well, what's the problem? They said, we were, we were felling a tree and the axe head fell in the water. And alas, Master, it was borrowed. You know what his first question was? Show me where it fell in. Show me where it fell in. In other words, where you left the Lord, where you departed from Bible precept, is where you need to go back to. And it's not going to help you to go any other place until you go there. Maybe you left Bible precept when you got in a fight with someone over nothing. Maybe you left Bible precept when you decided to drift down the path of lust. Maybe you left Bible precept when you figured your bitterness was justifiable. Maybe you left Bible precept when you decided worldliness was where it's at and godliness was not. Maybe wherever you left Bible precept is where you need to start back in. Amen. Don't, don't try to prance around in some uh, fancy how-to-do-it Christian life seminar when you know full well what the Holy Spirit is saying right now. Yeah. That's where you left Bible precept. That's where you've walked away from my will. By the way, if you don't choose to get into the will of God and get right with God where you left and where the power of God left you and where the axe head fell in, if you don't choose to get right with God when you do finally end up coming back into God's will, you'll never enter it where you left it. I'm talking about in the blessing. You'll never get back into the will of God where you got out of the will of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm talking about when, when you finally say, you know what? I, I've wasted my life and I didn't get right back in and I didn't come back to the place of my disobedience and deal with that first. Then when you eventually do try to come back and clamor back into the church house and clamor back into service for the Lord, whew, the drift and the current will have been so sudden and so severe. You say, I got out there. How's it that I'm getting back in here? Because the current of this world is as real as the nose on your face. There are people you know that used to go to this church, that used to worship God, that used to love the Lord, and now they're not in church anywhere, and they're not worshiping God, and they're not serving the Lord. You say, how could that be? Because this current of this world is strong, mighty strong. You know what? Every day we need to be letting the Lord wrap His cords Amen. of love around us. And we need to be letting the Word of God wrap itself around us. And we need to be wrapping our cords of love around each other. Amen. One day I was, I was trying to study and I heard some kind of crazy commotion going on. And I looked out the window and you know what I saw? My boys. One boy had the end of a lasso. And on the other end of that lasso was another one of my boys and his ankle. And my one boy was dragging the other boy across the lawn. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's just like the devil. The devil's constantly coming into a church with his lasso, trying to play cowboy, throwing that lasso. And he doesn't care if he gets a head or an arm or a leg. He'll grab whatever he can and drag you out. I've experienced this in recent days in my own church and seen how the devil can just wreak havoc in a home and in a life and in a marriage and in a church. And what's he doing? Always throwing that lasso, throwing that little bait out. And anybody that'll grab on, he'll yank him out. Cause whatever kind of irreparable damage there are. That's why we need to be letting the Lord throw His cords of love around us. Letting the Word of God wrap itself around us. Throwing cords of love around each other to show we care and we care for each other. And we're not going to let the devil do that. You see it? 
There needs to be a return to Bible precept. And that's exactly what Jonah did. Isn't this amazing? This is wonderful, in fact, that Jonah could return to the Lord right there in the belly of the whale. Amen. He didn't wait for soft organ music and, and padded pews and stained glass windows. He just got right, right there. Amen. That's a good place. Get right, right there. And go back to where the axe head fell in before this current sweeps you away and spits you out and you have to clamber back into safety someplace you don't even recognize. Yeah. And they don't even recognize you. Yeah. You come back, watch. You come back from the far country like Ruth <clears throat> and like Naomi. They look at you and they say, is that you, Naomi? Whew. Jonah got right in the belly of the whale. Now watch what he said, verse 4. He says, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Can anybody help tell me? Can anybody help me and tell me how that's even possible? You know what he was doing? He was returning to Bible precept. You ought to write right there in verse number 4, right next to it, you ought to write 2 Chronicles chapter 5, 6, and 7. Because that was when Solomon dedicated the temple and he prayed a beautiful prayer in chapter 6 and, and God answered in chapter 7. In his prayer in chapter 6, he said, Lord, please put your blessing upon this place and upon this people. And if at any time we turn away from you and you have to send the sword or pestilence or famine or captivity, if in the midst of the sword and pestilence and famine and captivity, we turn back to this place and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, will you hear from heaven and forgive our sin and heal, their land, heal our land? And the Lord said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So when Jonah is doing this, he is just returning to Bible precept. Uh, in Acts or in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, uh, Je Jehoshaphat did the same thing. Moab, the inhabitants of Mount Seir and Ammon, they allied against Israel and they came down to, to wipe it out. I mean, completely wipe it out. And he cried unto the Lord and he, he declared a fast and the women and the men were gathered together with their families holding their children and he prayed and he said, Lord, he said, you told us if we would turn back to this place, you would hear from heaven and forgive our sins. What was Jehoshaphat doing? He was returning to Bible precept. In light of the danger, the impending threat, he said, now we're going to return to Bible precept and we're seeking your face. We have no might against this great company, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. You see, it was a return to Bible precept and Jonah is doing just that. We don't know how long it was that he was down there. Maybe as he looked down and saw the great big mouth and the two little beady eyes and the great big fin, he said, oh boy, <laughs> Here it comes. And boy, that thing swallowed him up. Maybe right then and there he said, well, there's no use in wasting any more time. I might as well get right with God. Maybe it was after the first day and he thought, maybe this thing, can I tickle its innards and let it spit me out somewhere? Uh, maybe it was the second day. We don't know if it was the very end of the third day. But he finally came to and said, I'm going to return towards your holy temple. How's that possible in the belly of a whale? He doesn't have a compass. He doesn't have the rising sun in the east and the setting sun in the west. He doesn't have the moon and the stars to direct him to know which way is Israel. Which way should I turn? In fact, if he did turn which way, it might be straight up or straight down. <laughs> but you know, I think there's a principle here is that God's not all that interested in form, although form does matter to a degree. He's not as interested in form as he is in your heart. Amen. And you know the way to turn, you know the way to turn, which direction do you go to turn to God? Is it north, south, east, west? Here it is. It's straight down. Yes, amen. And it's not just with a posture outwardly, it's with a posture inwardly amen. and a brokenness and a tenderness and a humility and a sincerity. That's what pleases God. Yes. And that's what begins to get God's attention on your behalf. A return to Bible precept. Now, Bible precept. We're not talking about some holy book. We're not talking about some religious writing. We're talking about Bible precept. Yeah. Any problem in your marriage is because somewhere along the way, recently or long ago, you walked away from the Bible. Right. 
Any problem in your home is because recently or long ago, you walked away from the Bible. Bible. Our problem is a Bible problem. It doesn't matter what the question is. The answer is always the same. More Bible, more Bible, more Bible. Let's get back to the Bible. We're Bible-believing Baptist folks. That means B, we believe in biblical authority as the only authority, the only authority for faith and practice. So we come back to the Bible. Anytime where a preacher gets off in his philosophy or his doctrine is a Bible problem. He hasn't studied the Bible. He doesn't know what the Bible is. He's let some man direct him instead of the Bible directing him. We need to be people of the book. I don't know what all the other churches in Surrey or Surrey County or Isle of Wight County or I don't know what all the other churches around here are doing, but this this church needs to be filled with Bible-loving people. Amen. People that don't just yeah. bring it to church, but they read it on their own. Yeah. They study it. They understand it. They fill their lives full of, they, full of it. They talk to their children about it. Yeah. We need to be filled with Bible and tolerate nothing less but Bible Amen. as far as the answer yeah. goes. Yeah. I want to ask, are you a Bible-loving home? Yes. Is, it, is it 5% of the time, 10%? Or is it just filling your house? Filling your house. It ought to be an aroma like those scented candles you ladies put out. You just walk in, you say, oh, that, smell, that smells like Hosea. What? That smells like John. Well, that smells like 1 Corinthians 13 right there. Boy, a little bit of charity. Boy, that smells like, that smells like Acts. These people are busy serving the Lord. What? That smells like, that smells like Genesis 22. Their all is on the altar. Boy, this, this is a Bible-loving place and a Bible-loving home. And it's not just Bible on the outside. It's Bible all over. Whew, thank God for it. I want you to understand there must be a return to Bible precept. Everybody in this country that has been anybody that has made a difference for good and for God has been connected to the Bible. Douglas MacArthur said, There is not a night, sir, when I do not, when I, I do not take my Bible, open its pages, and read from its context, contents the truth of God's Word. It was, it was Andrew Jackson said, who, who said who pointed to the Bible and said, That book, sir, is the rock upon which our republic rests. Yeah. It was John Quincy Adams who said he reads three to five chapters of the Bible every day. And it employed about an hour of his time. What is this? A return to Bible precept. Notice what he says here in this passage. In verse number 8. Six, he says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Okay, what is, what is he saying? There is no hope at this point that he's going to get out. But he says, you've brought my life up from corruption. You know what he's doing? He's believing God. Verse number 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. What's he saying? My prayer made it. Yeah. Now this is the prayer he prayed in the belly of the whale. And after he got out, wrote down that he prayed. Verse number 7, he, verse number 8, then they that observe, some, some of you men or you pre, any man in this place ought to take this text and preach a message on it. Verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. What a mouthful of truth. You want to forsake your mercy and the mercy that God has set aside for you and has bestowed upon you? Just forsake it all by observing lying vanities. Verse 9, But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Watch verse number 2. He said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. This is before he gets out. Thou heardest my voice. Watch this. Number two, there must be a return to Bible precept. Number two, there must be a renewal. There must be a renewal of believing prayer. There must be a renewal of believing prayer. I want you to see this over and over. Look, we're not just looking for prayer. We're looking for believing prayer. What differentiates the prayer of this church and the people of this church and the prayer of the Buddhist temple I was in in Singapore a few years ago? Well, you say, we're sincere. Well, they were sincere. Well, you say, <clears throat> uh, it's based upon 
principles in the Bible. Well, they were basing theirs on principles of their religion. Well, you say it was, it was fervent. Theirs was fervent. I watched as they came into a building about this size, maybe a, a little bit longer, but about this size. In the front, there was a statue of the Buddha and then his assistant God. And, uh, and they came in, they put on their robes, and they prayed fervently. They prayed sincerely. They prayed based upon principle. What's the difference? Well, what it's based upon matters. And if it's based upon the Bible, it's true. But listen, it's got to be filled with faith. Jesus said the heathen pray, and they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Sometimes we come to the Lord and we think we'll be heard because of our much speaking. We've got all this filler language. Thank you for this day, Lord. Bless you. I ought to try to pray sometime without using the word bless. I'm not against the word bless. I believe in it. But sometimes we just use it as filler word. We need to be careful of that. Now watch. But whatever we do when we pray, we need to believe God. And it doesn't have to be a massive amount of faith. He says a little enough faith is good. The faith is the size of a grain of mustard seed will move mountains, but we need to believe. Amen. Not, not pray with this fatalistic mindset. Well, I did my duty and I prayed and I checked that off my list today. But Lord, I'm going to believe that you're going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to believe that you're going to provide. That's our God. Yeah. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Amen. That means if you can think it, God can do it. Yes. It's just that simple. In fact, he can do above what you think. In fact, he can do exceedingly Amen. above what you think. Matter of fact, he can do exceedingly abundantly above what you can think. And so here he says, you believe God. You believe God when you pray. Matthew 7, 7 and 8, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. In the book of Mark, chapter number 12, the Bible says, What things soever ye ask when ye pray, believing ye shall receive them. Do you believe that? What things soever ye desire when ye pray? Yes. This is what the scripture says in the book of Jeremiah 33. 3, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And what about 1 John chapter number 5 where the Bible clearly says in 1 John 5 and verse number 14, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. In other words, if you brought it before the Lord, prayed in His will, in His name, you've prayed in faith, it's as good as done. That's what the Bible is saying. Amen. In Matthew chapter 18, He says, where two or three are gathered together in My name, there am I in the midst. And in the verses preceding it, He said, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of My Father, which is in heaven. It's one of the strongest prayer promises constructed in the language ever in the Bible. Amen. It shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. In other words, our God delights in answering prayer. In fact, in John chapter 15, he said, Ask and, and receive that your joy may be full. He's asking us to ask. Our God is inviting us to ask. Why would you pray with trepidation? Why would you pray with, with inhibition? Why would you pray with a, a little bit of hesitancy? Ask. Hey, our God has a storehouse of vast requests that he wants to answer. Yeah. Why would you not cash in? Yeah. Cash in. I like what Dawson Trost Trotman said, the founder of the Navigators. He said, young people, don't ask for petty little trinkets and plastic little toys from God. Yeah. Ask him for continents. Yeah. Ask him for nations. Amen. That's the kind of God we serve. Yeah. He said to the Savior, ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Would to God we'd have some Christians that would say, God, I'm claiming thousands for you. Yeah. And, and not just say it to say it or say it to impress. By the way, when you pray, you shouldn't be praying for the others around you to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking to the one God, the one true God. You should be praying for him. And if you're praying for others to hear, then God's not listening. Yeah. Because your prayer is all wrong. It's all a farce. It's based upon insincerity. When you pray, ask him for nations. I appreciate so much meeting the shepherds. They were missionaries to Africa for some time. And the, the lady said one day, she said, we were praying and we were in prayer. And I was saying, oh, God, save dozens. Oh, God, save dozens this year. And it was like the Lord said, why dozens? So she said, oh, God, oh, God, save hundreds. And he said, why hundreds? And she said, well, God, I don't know if I can pray for more. 
She said, oh, God, save thousands. And she said, in a stretch of period of time in our mission, there were literally thousands of people that came to Jesus Christ. Now, this is in the last 20 or 30 years. Well, if God did it, then he can do it now. If God did it there, he can do it here. Now, I'm not saying that we're being presumptuous. It's not presumptuous to pray in the will of God. And it's not presumptuous to speak to your father. I want you to keep your finger here in Jonah, since we're talking about it and on the subject of believing prayer. And since you brought it up, look at Romans chapter 8. This is so good. Romans chapter 8. It says in verse 20, we, we, we get a lot of convoluted ideas in this thing of prayer. And, and we develop ideas and traditions and, and think, I, thinking that's just not right. And there has to be a change in our thinking. We're, we're king. We're children of the king. So pray. Pray believing. Don't you want to give good gifts to your children? If you want to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give good gifts to them that ask Him? Romans chapter 8, in verse number 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession. All right, who is he that searcheth the hearts? The Lord Jesus Christ. All things are naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Verse number 27, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wow. So in verse 26, the Spirit takes what we offer in prayer. Sometimes we're offering a prayer for a health need. And we're saying, God, please. And sometimes we say, I don't know how to pray for this. Okay. Err on the side of life. I think that's all within the realm of God's pleasure. No. If they're going to die, and it's God's will for them to die, then that's fine. And, and it's always right to resign yourself to God's will. God, this is my will, but I want what you want. So I'm not trying to pray against your will. But we don't know. When Jesus prayed and said, Father, not my will, but thine be done, number one, he was setting an example. Number two, he was looking at the enormous burden that would be placed upon him, the sins of all humanity at the cross, and the suffering and the rejection that he would experience. And he was saying, if there's another way, but Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Okay, so when we come to death, it's not really apples, it's really apples and oranges. We're saying, Lord, I'm going to resign to the will of God. But I believe that you're a God of life. I've come that they might have life and that they might have a more. Why not pray that? Amen. And, and if you prayed wrongly, but you prayed sincerely, I'm sure the Lord will let it pass. <laughs> He'll forgive you. I, I'm not trying to be irreverent here. But I'm saying we, we have wrong ideas. Well, I, I just dare not pray for life because that might be against the will of God. Why would it be against the will of God? Now, of course, you need to be careful and you need to be cautious. And yes, you need to resign to the will of God. But there's nothing wrong with praying for life. I mean, we fight for life. We, we struggle for life. I mean, all of us that are getting older are trying to do everything we can to look more alive than we are. Yeah. <laughs> Why is it wrong for us to come before the Lord with a humble heart, sincerely resigning to His will and saying, Lord, I'm going to err on the side of life and I'm just going to believe that you can and that you're able to do this. Sometimes we're praying for a financial need to be met. Lord, meet this financial need. Lord, show yourself strong. Now, I doubt that people are praying, Lord, give me $10 million so that I can go on a perpetual vacation. Now, if you're praying that, then you do need some corrections. But if you're, if you're praying, Lord, take this and move this mountain, this bill. Lord, I pray that you'd help me. I want to get my finances in order. There's nothing wrong with praying for God to meet that. And he'll do it in a myriad of ways. Yeah. I want to just say that we need to pray believing. Yeah. And we need to pray that God can. And it says, when we come to the Lord and we don't know what to pray. Has anybody here besides me ever been in that position? Lord, I don't know what to pray. And I, I think that's a genuine uh, position. Lord, I, I've tried to pray. Maybe you've prayed so much and the tears have flown. So, they, they've flowed so much. You, you just are at a loss. A lump in the throat, nothing more. Lord, I don't know what to pray. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He translates that to the Savior. He that searcheth the hearts. And the Savior who searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit 
So the Spirit knows what you're praying, even when you don't even know what you're praying. And He translates that to the Savior. And the Savior knows what you're praying. And He listens to the Spirit and takes that and understands that and takes that to the Father. <laughs> like what one preacher said, he said, the Spirit knows what you want and wants to give you what you want in according to God's will. And the Savior longs to answer your prayer. and He knows what you want, even though you can't actually uh, interpret it properly and say it and word it rightly. And he interprets that to the Father. Someone said, well, that's called insider trading. <laughs> There's a monopoly going on here. There is a monopoly. God has a monopoly on the impossible. And Jesus Christ does have a monopoly on answered prayer. There's no one else that, that does. There's no one else that can. And, and look at what it says in Romans chapter 8 since we're on the subject. He says in verse number 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Yes, amen. Amen. Wow. Look what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying he gave us his son. Yes. His only begotten son. Yes. This little bill, this little physical impairment. Yes, God may choose to let you keep it. And in that case, you need to just resign to this will. All right, Lord, I'm going to take that. And, and your grace is bigger than all this. And I, I want your grace to be magnified and your glory to be seen. Well, Lord, I'm going to trust you and pray. Believe. In other words, the only key that opens the door to prayer is belief. Amen. Amen. Why would we settle for anything less? Yeah. And we're talking about this in relationship to saving a country. J. Edwin Orr, on the subject of revival, made this very clear statement. He said there has never been in the history of our country or the church, a spiritual awakening that did not begin in united prayer. Let me recount what God has done through concerted, united, sustained prayer. Can I? Not many people realize that in the wake of the American Revolution following 1776 to 1781, there was a moral slump. Drunkenness became epidemic out of a population of 5 million 300,000 were confirmed drunks. Profanity was the most shocking kind. For the first time in the history of the American settlement, women were afraid to go out at night for fear of assault. Bank robberies were a daily occurrence. The churches were in a mess. The Methodists were losing more members than they were gaining. The Baptists said that it had their most wintry season. The Presbyterians in general assembly deplored the nation's ungodliness. In a typical congregational church, the Reverend Samuel Shepherd of Lenis, Massachusetts, in 16 years had not taken in one young person into fellowship. The Lutherans were so languishing that they, dis they discussed among uh, uniting with the Episcopalians, who were even worse off. The Protestant Bishop of New York, Bishop Samuel Provost, quit functioning. He had confirmed no one for so long that he decided he was out of work, so he took up other employment. The Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, wrote to the Bishop of Virginia, James Madison, that the church was too far gone ever to be redeemed. Voltaire averred and Tom Paine echoed, Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years. The liberal arts colleges were still, at that time, in a morass. A poll taken at Harvard had discovered not one believer in the whole student body in a school that was founded to train preachers. They took a poll at Princeton, New Jersey, in a much more evangelical place where they discovered only two believers in the entire student body. Only five that did not belong to the filthy speech movement of that day. Students rioted, they held mock communion at Williams College, and they put on anti-Christian plays at Dartmouth. They burned down the Nassau Hall at Princeton, which was the chapel. They forced the resignation of the president of Harvard. They took a Bible out of a local Presbyterian church in New Jersey and burnt it in a public bonfire. Christians were so few on campus in the 1790s that they met in secret like a communist cell and kept their minutes in code so that no one knew. How did it change? Through concerted, Amen. believing prayer. There was a Scottish preacher in Edinburgh named John Erskine who published a memorial, as he called it, pleading with the people of Scotland and elsewhere to unite in prayer for the revival of religion. He sent a copy of this little book to Jonathan Edwards in New England. He was so moved that he wrote a response which grew longer than a letter and he wrote a humble attempt to promote prayer 
amongst God's people. It took hold. This movement started in Britain through William Carey, Andrew Fuller, and John Sutcliffe, and God moved in a very unusual way. In New England, there was a man of prayer uh, named Isaac Bacchus, a Baptist preacher who in 1794, when conditions were at their worst, addressed an urgent plea for prayer for revival to pastors of every denomination so that they would call their people to pray. Churches knew that their backs were to the wall. All the churches adopted a plan until America, like Britain, was interleased with a network of prayer meetings, which aside, set aside the first Monday of each month to pray. It wasn't long before revival came. When the revival reached the frontier in Kentucky, it encountered a people wild and irreligious. Congress had discovered that in Kentucky, there had not been more than one court of justice held in five years. Peter Cartwright, a Methodist evangelist, wrote that when his father had settled in Logan County, Kentucky, it was known as Rogue's Harbor. The decent people in Kentucky formed regiments of vigilantes to fight for law and order and then fought a pitched battle with outlaws and lost. There was a Scottish-Irish preacher who was known, his name was James McCready, and his chief claim to fame was he was so ugly people came to see him. (laughs) McCready settled in Logan County, pastored three little churches, and he wrote in his diary that the winter of 1799, for the most part, was weeping and mourning with the people of God. Lawlessness prevailed everywhere. McGreedy was such a man of prayer that not only did he promote the concert of prayer every first Monday of the month, but he got his people to pray for him at sunset on Saturday evening and sunrise on Sunday morning. Then in the summer of 1800 came the great Kentucky revival. 11,000 people showed up at a communion service. McGreedy hollered for help regardless of denomination. Out of that second great awakening came the whole modern missionary movement and its societies. Out of it came the abolition of slavery, popular education, Bible societies, Sunday schools, and many social benefits accompanying the evangelistic fervor. Let me read what happened in 1904 and 1905. The movement lasted for a generation, but at the turn of the 1900s, there was a need of awakening again. And a general movement of prayer began with special prayer meetings at Moody Bible Institute, at Keswick Conventions in England, and places as far as Melbourne, Australia, Wonsan in Korea, and the Nilgiri Hills of India. So all around the world, believers were praying that there might be another great awakening in the 20th century. In the revival of 1905, a young man became famous who was a professor. His name was Kenneth Scott LaTorre. He reported that at Yale in 1905, 25% of the student body were enrolled in prayer meetings and in Bible study. As far as churches were concerned, the ministers and preachers of Atlantic City reported that of a population of 50,000, there were only 50 adults left unconverted. Portland, Oregon, 204. 240 major stores closed from 11 to two each day to enable people to attend prayer meetings and they signed an agreement so that there wouldn't be unfair competition between the stores. This is America. See, sometimes we think at a certain point it was all Bible. Nothing was wrong. No, 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 that's not the case. There were people that were wicked then just as they are now. People that had wrong ideas then just as they had now. And there were people that decided that God answers prayer then, just as there needs to be now. What can save America? A return to Bible precept. What can save America? A renewal of believing prayer. Number three. Notice what the Bible says in Jonah 2 and verse 10. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. There's your answer to prayer. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. How many of you are thankful that God's word comes the second time? Well, we need it. Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was his sermon. He was a short preacher just like Oded was yesterday. He said, Brother Dwight, I'd wish you'd take some notes. 
So here comes Jonah and he preaches. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Yes. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And at a certain point it started, Yet 35 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 30 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Only 25 days. 20 days. 10 days. 5 days left to seek God. Look what happened. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Do you know why I believe that God can save and rescue and move in America? Do you know why I believe that? Because of Jonah. Yeah. Because of Nineveh. Yeah. Nineveh was a people that did not deserve to be forgiven. And Jonah was a preacher that did not deserve to be used. And God used Jonah and forgave Nineveh. Yes. The whole lot of them. Yes. Every one of them. Amen. So why not pray for that now? Why not get the name of the mayor of Smithfield and the governor of Virginia and the leaders and say, God, do in their hearts what you did in the king of Nineveh's heart. Why not? Why not get the name of the president and the vice president and his cabinet and say, God, do in their hearts what you did in Nineveh's hearts. And, and, and not just the people that are in a place of position and leadership, but everyone. Why not get the president or the name of the principals in this town and instead of cursing the public schools and talking about how bad they are, and certainly there's godless education there, how about saying, God, change the heart of those in leadership? Yeah. And send a wave of conviction. How, how, about, how about just driving your car in the parking lot of the public school right down the road every day yeah. or every week yeah. and just spending a, about five, ten minutes in prayer praying for that school. Amen. For the teachers. Yes. For the students. That God would send a wave of Holy Ghost conviction. Amen. That where there's evil, it would be, it would be exposed yes. at the highest levels. Yes. Hey, I, I don't know, is the... Um, is the drug problem not a problem here in this uh, county? It's bad, I hear. I hear it's real bad. How about there, there's love between uh, blacks and whites and, and uh, sweet communion? Is that, is that the way it is? Or is there some animosity going on? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's animosity. Right. Well, how about praying that God would, would wipe all that away? Amen. <laughs> How about praying that there would be some kind of massive wave right here in Smithfield? Yes. And then over into Newport News. Yes. How about praying that every ship that comes into harbor would fall under deep conviction and every foreigner would feel their need of God? Amen. And then preach. Because number three, there must be a return to Bible precept. Number two, a renewal of believing prayer. And number three, a revival of blessed and Bible preaching. Amen. A revival of blessed and Bible preaching. What God has chosen throughout the eons of time to accomplish His work is preaching. God has set this in order. God has named this as His method. God is the one that has nailed down for you and for me that preaching is what needs to get the job done. This preaching seems to have fallen on hard times. Someone says, oh, no, don't you preach at me as if preaching was bad. Or someone else says, now, look, I'm just talking to you right now. I'm not preaching to you as if preaching was a bad thing. There has been a wane of preaching in our day. 
And there needs to be a revival of preaching in our day. Matthew chapter number 3, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35, he went about all the cities and the villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. In the book of Acts, the Bible says they went everywhere preaching. In Acts chapter 8 and verse number 4, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere we're preaching the word. Acts 8 and verse 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter number 8, later in the text, it says he found one man sitting in a chariot and he preached it into him, Jesus. Yes. How, how is it that Bible preaching has fallen on such hard times? How is it that people have loathed preaching? Maybe because the preacher has not done his duty to maintain the integrity right. of the office and the pulpit. Right. Maybe, maybe because there have been people with stones in their hands yeah. of accusation and criticism and they stoned the preacher. I was on the phone today with a preacher who's just had a son that's gone through a terrible accident and the people in his church, they're not satisfied. They're still stoning the preacher at one of the hardest times in his life. Maybe preaching has fallen on hard times because the devil hates it. But it doesn't matter if the devil hates it. God has chosen to honor it. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, he says in verse number 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, he said after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Study your Bible and study all throughout history and God chose preaching to get the job done. He didn't call for some guy to get up in skinny jeans and have a lot and sit down on a stool with flip-flops and give a talk. That's yeah. not what God called men to do. Amen. God called men to stand on their own two hind legs and with a backbone and with courage yeah. and with a fearlessness and with the faith of Almighty God, open up the Bible and say, yes. Thus saith the Lord. Amen. And let the chicks fall where they're dead. Yeah. And by the way, preaching is something that is aimed right for the heart. Yeah. Teaching is not aimed for the heart, it's aimed for the head. Nothing wrong with good teaching. There's a need for good teaching. Amen. But preaching is aimed for a decision. Yeah. I'm causing, when I preach, I'm I'm trying to cause a riot or revival. Amen. 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 I'm just reading about Jonathan Wesley. And Jonathan Wesley came into a town, into a house, and the whole throng of that town came in to kill him, to stone him, to cast him out. And he stood up on a chair so that he could be above the people and they could see him. And with tears and with reason and with scripture, he warmed their hearts and they were ashamed. And the next morning they showed up at his house at 5 a.m., to hear preaching. <laughs> and I'll tell you, if we preachers aren't careful, we'll think that maybe preaching is the problem. Right. We'll think that maybe God's method isn't what gets the job done. Yeah. But God's method is what gets the job yeah. done. Yeah. It's always get what gets the job done. Fearless, blessed, and Bible preaching. Amen. I'm not talking about reading the Reader's Digest. I'm not talking about the preacher like the preacher that my dad had when he was growing up. Uh, he'd take a text, read a verse, and tell about the movie he went to the night before. I'm not talking about that kind of slop. Right. I'm not talking about Bible preaching that causes men to be shuddered in their own seats in tremble and fear. I'm talking about Bible preaching that causes men to lift themselves to the heights yeah. and the Holy Spirit to cause them to soar like eagles. I'm talking about Bible preaching that will cause a jailer to shudder and realize that though he's the free man, he's the prisoner. Yeah. I'm talking about preaching that causes whole streets to yeah. turn to, to turn towards God. Yeah. I'm talking about that kind of preaching is what saves a country. Yes. It has to happen. Amen. It can't just happen within the four walls of this place. Yeah. And it can't just be done by that man. Yeah. It needs right. to be done by everyone in this room. Amen. It needs to be done outside the doors of this Amen. church and outside the walls. Look here. You know, if we're not careful, we'll let the liberals say, all right, wait just a second. You can't say that. Yeah. Yeah. And all right, wait. All right, okay. You can say that here in this pulpit, yeah. but you can't say that anywhere else. Yeah. You know what we need to be doing? I'm not talking about being arrogant and haughty. I'm talking about taking our Bible, hiding it in our hearts, going out into the highways and the bed, highways and the byways and the streets and in the and, and in the marketplace and in the courtyards and in the factories and in the schools and saying, Thus saith the Lord, Amen. the Bible says, yes. and trying to plead with men to get right with God. Amen. I should be the only one trying to be preached for a decision. You should. Yeah. And you should. And by the way, for some young man or older man for that matter, that God is calling to preach, if he calls you to preach, do it! Yes. I'm not ashamed that I'm a preacher. Amen. I'm thankful to be a preacher. Yes. I'm blessed to be a preacher. I'm humbled that God yes. would let me preach. I'm not ashamed of it one minute. Amen. I've been having the time of my life for the last yes. decades, traveling from place to place and preaching. 
preaching the word of God. Sometimes it's been exciting. Sometimes it's been scary. Sometimes people have liked it. Sometimes they haven't. Sometimes they've walked out. Sometimes they haven't come back. Sometimes they've thrown to hear it. But every time when I get up and preach the Bible, I know something almighty from almighty God has happened and something amen. supernatural has happened. And long after I've said a final amen, yeah. I know that the word of God yeah. is still into the far-reaching crevices of their heart. And God, let me have a little part of their future conversion. Amen. Amen. Don't you be ashamed of preaching. Yes. Don't you be ashamed of your preacher for preaching. Amen. Don't you be ashamed of Bible preaching. Yes. You ought to be ashamed if we're not preaching. Yes. And I'll tell you this. If we don't take the message and go outside these four walls and preach, pretty soon they're going to chase us inside these four walls. Yes, sir. And say we can't even preach from here. Yeah. You know what they said about the early Americans in a courtroom? They said these Baptists, they're just insistent. You can't even walk around and cross the street without somebody trying to grab you and shove a text down your throat. He said, well, I thought we weren't supposed to do that. Well, don't worry about what everybody thinks and says. And I'm not saying we need to be mean and arrogant and haughty. I'm not saying there's any place for that. Amen. But the very thing this world doesn't have, yes. the Bible, is the very thing this world needs. And it's not an act of hatred. It's an act of love to Amen. give them the Bible. Amen. Amen. God give us some preachers and some young yeah. people and some adults and some women that will go everywhere, hither and yon, yeah. passing out tracks. Now, I saw the track rack tonight. Yeah. It's slammed full. Yeah. Maybe, uh, I don't want to misspeak. It may have just been filled yesterday. <laughs> it's very likely that in a church like this, it has to be filled every single service. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. But just in case this church is not that way, and just in case this is an above average church, and that track rack hasn't been filled last week or today, and maybe it's been stuffed like that for the last three months, God give us some men who leave the auditorium tonight, go grab the track rack, and not leave it in the back hallway, but put it right here where people have to stumble over it on their way out, and it'll be emptied and refilled in the next month. Amen. Amen. What's that? It's Bible preaching. Yes. So what did God do with Jonah? He used him. Low down, rotten, worthless preacher. Wasn't even glad when God blessed his preaching. God still used him. Yeah. You know what that means, Brother Gary? There's hope for me. Yeah. <laughs> if God can save Nineveh and use Jonah, yeah. he can save America and use me. Yeah. Would you bow with me in prayer? Yeah. Lord.